In this video, I have a really good chat with psychedelic researcher Dick Kahn, who's author of the DMT and My Cult Mind series of books. And we discuss everything from like what's happening in a psychedelic experience, through to being a psychonaut parent, through to theories about reality. We talk about aliens, Alistair Crowley, it's the whole hog. Now, I know I say this every time, but this was a superb conversation, easily one of my favorites. And I think we only just scratched the surface here. So hopefully there'll be a few more of them further down the line. I think the thing I like most about this conversation was that we both had some different ideas about many things, but we were able to share and appreciate each other's perspectives. And I had quite a long list of questions that I wanted to tackle with Dick, but this conversation, it just kept flowing. And before we knew it, 90 minutes had passed. So I want to say a huge thank you to Dick himself for making the time to chat. I really appreciated his openness and his honesty and the amount of effort he puts into documenting his experiences through these two books, it really is a monumental achievement. I think like myself, he has a very kind of you know, warts and all approach to psychedelics. So he doesn't shy away from some of the more difficult aspects of things like DMT. And yeah, I mean, he's just a great guy. It was a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did and find something useful in here, or at least find it entertaining. I just want to give a quick shout out to my patrons who support the show. It's through their donations that I can do things like buy books to research guests like today. So it's not like it's only me you're supporting. It also gets passed on to other creators within the psychedelic community. Dick's books are available on Amazon and there's a link below. So if you're looking for a good read while you're sipping your pina coladas by the swim pool, then go and pick that up. I got the Kindle version because I am a child of the future and also because Mother Ayahuasca told me not to murder trees. Anyway, that's enough of my rambling. So without any further ado, I bring you Dick Kahn, author of DMT and My Occult Mind. Enjoy. So I am here with fellow psychonaut, author of multiple books on the topic of psychedelic exploration and no doubt master of incognito disguises, Dick Kahn. So Dick, thanks so much for making the time to, uh, to talk to me. I've been really looking forward to this one for a while. I know I've been trying to set it up uh, over the summer. Um, but yeah, I was actually recommended to talk to you by some of my subscribers. And um, since we started arranging this, which again, it was like a few weeks ago, I've been reading some of your books and I've been sort of making a few notes. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you, mate. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to picking your brain about some of these experiences I've been reading about. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, really, really excited to be here. Thank you. Good, mate. So I guess I think I think probably a one way I, to, to start things going is that Although I've kind of introduced you as like an author, I think that's really just a way that you document something much bigger that seems to be going on with what you do and all these incredible experiences you're having. So, yeah, a good place to start. So how would you describe what you do? That's a really good place to start because I'm 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 just a couple of days back from a brilliant ayahuasca retreat. Awesome. And I was thinking, I was like... Um, looking at my books when I came back, not reading them, but just looking at them. And I kind of realized that, you know, there's no way I could produce those books were it not for interacting with those other entities. So, you know, I know people write books, but th these books or this genre of book is, is, is quite unique. And I'm not saying there's only me writing these kind of books, but this looks like a new genre. And um, I mean, these experiences are profound life changing interactions with otherworldly entities, powerful otherworldly entities. And there's no way um, there would be no books if it weren't for that, you know, mysterious mind manifesting other of hidden nature. So, uh, you know, I, I have to sort of recognize that I was sort of pushing the pen or pressing the button, so to speak. But yeah, I mean, these experiences are, are not of my mind alone. These are interactions with powerful agency of hidden nature. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there is actually a genre for what you do, mate. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've had this comparison before, but I, I think there's a gonzo element to to what you do because, you, you know, I'm sure you've heard of Hunter Thompson and sort of his mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. adventures or misadventures. But it's I thought it was very similar to what you do. He's you're inserting yourself into this narrative and the, the narrative is happening to you, but you are also the narrative. It's a very sort of gonzo way of, of doing it, I think. So I, I think you're in good company there Mick, with what you do. That's a really high praise, Rob. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, I'm not sure I see it like that myself. I, I had those three very determined years where I went pretty hard at DMT and, you know, I was, 
keeping myself to myself by that. I mean, I wasn't on social media. I wasn't sharing each and every experience. It was just very much in my own little bubble with my family. And I'll be honest, a large part of the motivation was not just curiosity, but it kind of felt like I was taking on the world, so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that was really exciting. Well, that was another aspect that jumped out to me from, from your book is it, it does seem like this very transformative journey, not just in what was going on sort of psychedelically, but with you yourself. I, mean, I think by your own admission, you, you, you talked about being quite naive um, I think I think this was after the publishing of your first book and you, you kind of had this viewpoint of this people will just be interested in this because well because yeah, I mean shit it's happened to me and this is like amazing so you kind of expected the same kind of excitement to be out there but you yourself had to go through this kind of social media sort of personality transformation to get it out there so there really is this kind of to, to say that the journey was transformative I think is in it goes across sort of more ways than one. But I suppose, I mean, how, how would you, how do you think of that, that kind of, that transformation and how, I suppose, like, what were you thinking in terms of getting people to sort of, like, pay attention and how, how's, how's your viewpoint adjusted in towards, like, your second book? So I think, I think that transformation is still ongoing and I don't, I don't see transformation ever coming to an end in, in this lifetime, future lifetimes. I think that's, that's um, always um, going to be going on. Um when, when I first started, you know, I mean, because I'm self-published, I had to sort of do all my own marketing. And uh, the, the first kind of like online promotions I did, probably I, I over-egged them. You know, I was talking about uh, my research was revolutionary. And a couple of people pulled me up on that. And, and it, it kind of looked like I'd overlooked sort of Strassman's yeah. epic yeah. research that, that put me onto it. But, but all I meant by revolutionary is that, I was kind of like putting my neck on the line. I genuinely thought after publishing my book, I was going to get the police knocking on my door, you know, a few days later. So I, I probably over-egged it to begin with. And a couple of people were really kind and pulled me and said, look, you might want to just tone it down a bit. Yeah. But, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't being disrespectful and I wasn't thinking, you know, nobody else has experienced this. And I, I wasn't unmindful of Strassman's research, quite the opposite. So I did, did tone it down a little bit. Um, yeah, that, that transformation is, is, is still ongoing. I'm, I'm, I have a long way to go. Um, I, I don't want to say it, it is a journey, but it is that that's what it is. And it's, it's, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't see it as like promoting myself. I mean, these are wonderful opportunities to kind of share my stories and about my research, but for me, I'm, I'm not promoting myself. I'm more promoting the substance. And, and, and the experiences from the substance and, and my sort of occult analysis of those experiences. I'd rather do that than promote myself. Yeah, yeah. And I think that comes across in your writings, mate. It's very, uh, very sincere. And yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's probably what's kind of like, so it's sort of kind of a, a attractive and a sort of appealing about, about your personality. It, it is very sort of down to earth. Again, this is something I try and put into my own kind of, um, it's into my own channel and the own content I produce and I think it's these kind of voices is what I was looking for when I first started to get into this and I thought there was a lack of it so I think it's it's like I said that kind of transparent sincerity and again this came across in, in a lot of your experiences in the, I think in, in the first book which I think you, you acknowledge yourself that you probably wrote a bit too much about them even the kind of ones that didn't really go anywhere you're still writing about them yeah <laughs> But, but still, it's good to do that because there is a kind of mentality uh, where that everything has to be just amazing and everything has to be sort of fairy tales and unicorns. And it's, that's not always always the case. There is a kind of a gradient of, of these experiences. Absolutely. I mean, since I, I published the first book, which I've since retired and, and reissued as a much smaller revised version, uh, at the moment I'm going through a, a phase of I am reading so many books and as a consequence of that, it's made me think, damn, what have I done? Because there are some really smart minds out there, you know, much smarter than mine. And, and they've published books and, and some of them I'm, you know, blown away by. I think, you know, my God, it's not that I'm trying to compete with these people. I'm, I'm just trying to be myself. But I've realized in in sort of pursuing authorship in this genre, there are some very big giants there and um 
yeah, you know, um, I don't feel like I'm trying to compete with them or, or stand shoulder to shoulder with them. I'm kind of like thinking, damn, what what have I done? I, I kind of like, you know, I, I probably didn't realize what I was doing when I published the first book. And, and now it's kind of dawned on me. And, you know, I'm, I'm aiming for a third and final book in the DMT and my cult mind series. And I know it's going to have to be for me, it's going to have to be a masterpiece to my own satisfaction before I dare to publish it because of of that recognition of greater minds than mine. Yeah, and, is it, well, and I think it's that what you just said that, that you, you know, you do acknowledge that there are these, you know, this amazing sort of scientific and sort of philosophical people out there. That's all the more reason why I think your greatest asset is your integrity and it is your honesty. And it, because, yeah, you, you're not going to be, you know, the greatest sort of scientific, the Rick Strassmans who understand all the sort of the chemistry and stuff like that. That's, that's their role. And, you know, some of the greatest philosophers, that's their role. But I think some, for someone like yourself, the, the role that you have it is the important role. It is the role of the of the kind of the everyman. It's the sort of you're not you know necessarily trying to like you say insert yourself into some. I've got the answers. I've got the, the sort of yeah. This yeah. Is it. Every, everyone listen to me. I think that's a very uh, a very important voice, mate. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, I guess I have to play to my strengths and, and recognize that you know um, my strengths are you know uh, adherence to truth, working class roots, and. Uh, a real genuine sort of passion for the for this subject and this discussion. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I'd like to sort of like get into uh, talking about uh, some of your some of your different experiences. Can I just 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 come back to something you mentioned earlier? You, you, you mentioned you just come back from a from an ayahuasca retreat. So was that is that your your first time trying ayahuasca or? Uh, no, that's you... my it's my third retreat. So uh, you know, on previous retreats, I've, I've I would say I've tried ayahuasca several times before. Mm-hmm. Um, if I had the financial wherewithal and sort of, I, I don't want to say freedom from family because m- my wife's great, she gives me that freedom. But if I had the capacity in terms of time and finance to do more, I would have done more. But yeah, this was um, a domestic retreat, um, Friday night, Saturday night. And uh, wow, I mean, yeah, so it's my third one. And it was just, it was just the first night was just extremely intense. And that's, that's really what I'd, that's really what I wanted, you know. I wanted to see how how powerful it could be, and oh my god, it, it didn't hold back, you know. It really did put it on me. Yeah, I I, mean, I had a few a few uh, ayahuasca ceremonies before I I sort of really had that sort of eye opening experience, and I think it was about um it was I, I did a couple in Europe, and then it was when I went and did one in Peru, and it was like oh my god, now yeah, now I've I've seen what what people are talking about here. <laughs> So I think I think one one thing I'd love to sort of like start with and get into is about your perspective on what is actually happening within these experiences. And I think this this might be somewhere we can like sort of might may possibly civilly disagree. But yeah. is, is my understanding correct that that you you your perspective is that you think that this is like a, an external conscious system or life form that we're sort of contacting through these substances? To an extent, yeah, you could you could phrase it like that. I, I guess I'm kind of saying that there's a there's a hidden nature a hidden kingdom a a, a parallel universe a parallel world however you want to phrase it and mm-hmm. that that unseen kingdom is occupied with a, i i would suggest a, a vast diversity of of conscious agencies life forms entities um and i think with dmt the initial effects of dmt which i'm sure we'll speak about seem to promote uh, consistently a, a life-changing interaction with I would say higher beings from that realm and I'm not not saying it's all higher beings there I think esoteric and occult literature uh, points to the occupancy of those kingdoms having really sort of diverse populations with some you know uh, equal to man some far lower than than man and and some much and very much higher than man so, yeah, I guess that's where I'm coming from, and that's what I'm subtly arguing in my books. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the flavour that came across definitely seemed to be leaning towards the external. I think that's where I, I think I lean more towards the internal in the sort of terms of it, this being a, uh, a a journey through sort of consciousness and sort of ancestral archetypes and, and stuff like that. So, But again, there's, I, I, there's nowhere I'd, I'd plant my flag here and say this is absolutely it, and I think... The, the, the landscape that you just described there of, you know, 
it's yeah, I mean, who knows? If it, it's it's planes of existence, it could be internal, it could be external. It's sort of it's it's out of time. It's sort of it's transcendent. So there's a whole. Yeah, yeah. I'll, be, I'll be honest, Rob. I, I just I find these conversations fascinating because it's two different schools of thought, and 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 look, I, I've I've sort of made friends with people around the world, and and some of them are far more experienced than me with DMT you know, in, in terms of how far they've been and how many times they've been there. And I, I kind of like put forth my interpretation and, and, and give examples where I say, you know, this example really sort of points to it being something other than my own mind. And they'll just kind of come back and say, oh, no, that's like tactile hallucinations. And I'm like, you can't, I'm arguing you can't write it off by saying it's tactile hallucinations. But it's a fascinating subject. It really is. And it's... Uh, it's it's a great great topic for discussion. Yeah, I'd say it's probably the most fascinating subject, and certainly what what I've found from from my own experience is that, like I said, I could not plant a flag anywhere because I've had extremely sort of you know what what I've described as like sort of sci-fi futuristic sort of you know spread across the cosmos type experiences, and I've also had very what felt very ancient and ancestral yeah. kind of experiences. I've had something that's somewhere in the middle of those two, ones which didn't seem like anything at all other than sort of pure consciousness. So you really could. I mean, I, I mean, I have had, had like literal visions of, of like being on some, some kind of space station type, <laughs> type thing. There. So that contrasted with like the very earthy, organic -y, again, mo the more stuff I kind of tend to get from ayahuasca roots. Yeah, who knows? And so that, I, I, that's why I kind of like, I, I think the, the thing which I could balance or this is why I guess I lean more towards the internal because I think from, from the internal perspective, I, I can manage all those expectations. I, I can I have sci-fi thoughts i can have organic thoughts i can have yep. earthy thoughts and i've got ancestral thoughts so that all seems to work in, internally whereas wait if you sort of you know the people who go for the very sort of it's, it's dimensional portals to yeah you know xenu place or whatever that's very specific and so i, I would kind of stray away from that but yeah, I mean, let, let the flesh out if you've got any further thoughts I, on it. I, I, I tell you what, Rob, if, 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 if somebody came to me, if a really sort of like special, rare individual came to me and said, Dick, I can disclose to you now what the absolute truth of the matter is. And on condition of me disclosing that truth to you, you must cease your DMT research, withdraw your books from sale and wrap up this Dick Can thing that you've got going on and that's the condition of me disclosing the truth. I would say it's all wrapped up. I just want the truth because that's that's what it's about for me. It's kind of like pursuing that. You know, it's not about if I'm wrong and I and I find through my own research or other people's research convinces me I'm wrong. I'm not bothered about the fact that I've been wrong. I'm just happy that I found wow because that that truth is it's almost something tangible within your heart. You know, and it's it's gonna. I don't know. It's it's it's, it's gonna like it's gonna make your heart sing because you're like wow, that's that mystery has been solved. What's the next one? Well, that's that's quite that's kind of bold statement. So I think I would probably yeah, I would probably go on the other side of that because for me, I would say the the ex, the human experience that I'm having is kind of paramount. This is you know. I, whatever else is happening, if there's other planes of existence or if there's other sort of, you know, other realms of spirits or, or aliens or whatever, this is, this is it. This is what I've, I've got to interface with, with anything. So my kind of human experience is, is like primary to me. And I think, and if there are like realms, you know, like that happen sort of like near death experience or when you die and things like that, that's all going to happen anyway. So yeah. I don't need to, I'm not in a rush to sort of, you know, I'll, I'll die when I'm, when I'm good and ready. <laughs> but, um, but I'm sort of, and the kind of the example that I, I use here is, is that if somebody came up to me and said, look, I can, you know, I can explain to you 100% scientifically with no dis indisputable evidence um, why, why and how and the mechanics of how you love your wife. I'd be like, I don't, I don't care. It, like, <laughs> there's no amount of data that yeah. is going to 
assist me with my yeah. human condition of like if someone if you came and brought me the ster- the pheromone statistics and you yeah. know maybe maybe she's been drugging me with some sort of you know some Persephone perfume or something like that I don't know but but there's nothing that would yeah I get you. The, the yeah. mean to me meaning is everything so I I would in your position I would I would turn away the truth and I would focus on on on, on the personal experience I think. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. I suppose it's like the, like the rose, isn't it? Science can do all kinds of things with the rose. It can measure it. It can analyze it, but it can't explain why the rose is. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's that's the thing that comes out to me most from these um, sort of psychedelic experiences. To, to me, that they're, they're like they are pure meaning. It's, it's like meaning in its purest form, and it's that's kind of why they're so like transcendent and so slippery because. We, we could swap stories forever and yeah. very it's very hard to sort of convey some i mean you can do it a little bit you know and, and if you've had a similar experience then you might that like flash me go all oh, right yeah i get what you know about it. but it's again it's a very sort of a personal experience um and i think that's yeah that's where i try and focus i always look for the meaning within these experiences rather than the kind of the literal truth of them so even my space station example like if i find myself on a on the on the interplanetary like hub of consciousness which is like deep space nine sort of orbiting some black hole somewhere then i'm like okay what does why am i seeing this what does it mean to me rather than sort of coming back and saying to everyone everyone i've seen it i've seen the interplanetary <laughs> hub it's there it's real <laughs> you know, which which i must admit this is one thing when i when i was reading your stuff and, and you, again we're sort of we talk, it's about like you've been a, a, sort of a little bit naive and sort of evangelistic at the beginning we've all been there man. i was exactly the same like saying to me yeah. like this is amazing you've got to try this and i was just <laughs> ranting like a lunatic yeah, yeah. I, t- I tell you what then let, let's let's um bring um some experiences into it but before i do that when i when i was a little boy a magazine came out i think it's called the unexplained and you know I, I really loved that kind of stuff and i was really young and i'm i'm kind of leafing through it and you get to a few pages where it's talking about ufos you know and it's got some grainy black and white images of sort of classic disc ufos and i'm, I'm looking at and thinking that thought that every ufologist must have thought you know wow look at that it looks like a genuine craft why don't they just come down and land and say hello and then you know a few days later i'd, I'd be kind of like in the lounge at home and i'm really young at this age and my mum would go out of the lounge and i'd kind of feel that there was something in the the upper corner of the the room looking at me i could sense it you know it's like I can't see anything, but it's like there's something there watching me and didn't couldn't make that sort of connection that, you know, there is this sort of hidden other. My mind was far too young, but fast forward uh, quite a few years and I'm smoking DMT indoors. And then when I take the DMT outdoors, something happens and I've smoked it outside quite a few times. um, And and I've, I've occasionally found, you know, the black orb UFO will appear either at the conclusion of a, a profound experience or at the, the tail end of a sort of sub breakthrough experience. Or um, if it's not a black orb UFO slowly traversing the sky, it might be what ufologists would call an earth light or whatever creamy morph kind of orb slowly traversing the sky. And I don't know, I, I think that's really, that's really interesting because it, it does point to kind of some other that that's not just in my mind have you, have you ever heard of um a guy called donald hoffman who's got a theory called um interface theory perception i have not but we'll have i'll have to make a note of that donald hoffman yeah donald hoffman yeah i'll try and i'll try and i'm gonna butcher this now so let, let me let me try and out like what what it is it just was um so yeah his his shtick is that everything that we are seeing is um, a user interface for an underlying substrate. Now, there's there's a difference here because there's a very common set of psychedelic theories that um, everything is imagination, that there's there's that. And this is is slightly different to that. It's not that everything is imagination, it's that everything is a, um, like I say, like, like when you're on your computer and, you know, you see like, you know, a Windows folder and you see an icon to launch, you know, Internet Explorer or whatever. But that's not really what's happening in the computer. In the computer is zeros and ones. 
Mm. And you've, you've got a user interface to make it easier to, to work with. And that's what this guy's proposing is that everything that we sort of see around us is a user interface for a much stranger reality, um, which is where the primary, so the primary thing within this reality is consciousness. So we think that that matter comes first. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, as I do this, I'm banging on the table and everything around me is physical and I live my life as though matter comes first. But this guy's shtick is that consciousness comes first. And basically everything, this is more or less like wearing a set of VR goggles. It's just reality is being rendered to suit sort of what's happening in, conscious, in consciousness. And in that sort of viewpoint, what you've just described with the black orbs appearing, um, you are seeing them because you are in a different conscious state. So then different sort of conscious systems in, are, are now being represented as this black orb. And like if you had like say a, a conscious, so all we've got is networked conscious systems. And if there's one where which is like something that is particularly tranquil and at rest, we might see that as a tree, a very slow moving, you know, still alive. We recognize it as an alive system, but very slow moving. Or we might see something that's very hyper and sort of we think of as less conscious, which is a mouse or something like that. So that might be something you, for, worth you looking into. It's a it's a very weird theory, um, but well, it does well, yeah, explain it, a lot of stuff. It, it is and it isn't because, I mean, did you say it's Donald Hoffman? Yeah, I mean that that kind of that approach of consciousness first. I mean that that's that's one of the sort of primary considerations, if not the primary consideration of the sort of esoteric and occult mindset. You know that matter comes from mind. You know the the universe is a, a mental um, creation. It's not that you know mind comes from matter, but but contrary wise, um, with with the black orb UFO, I I, I kind of I buy what you're saying. But then what if I then go indoors and ask my family to come out and they seem the same thing and they've not, they don't, they can't smoke DMT. Well, again, the, the, the actual DMT element is, isn't sort of particularly critical to it. So that would, that would. All right. Okay. So that would be, again, it, it would, that would be dependent on that sort of change of matter. So it could, it's just that whatever. Yeah, whatever we are sort of seeing around us, which we interpret as physical reality. Again, I've got to apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm not super spotted right. up on this, guys. I'm, I'm, again, I'm not planting a flag. Say I super believe. It. I just think it's interesting. But yeah, he would say, um, you know, that a, you know, a UFO could appear because that's just sort of, you know, what those conscious systems need to appear. And it's a bit like, you know, like if um, you're a conscious system and you need help, and then something appears in reality, like, you know, whether it be a, a, a substance like a plant teacher that you turn to or a therapist, things come in and out of your life as you kind of, as in and out of the user interface, I should say, as you sort of, you know, as you sort of require them. But what what is, I mean, it, the example even goes far as like, there is no moon. There is just, the moon just appears because you, for whatever reason, you need the moon to appear. And it's like, it's like playing Grand Theft Auto. There is no Ferrari to your right but if you turn your viewpoint to the right then there is a ferrari but as soon as you turn your view away then it's not there but there is yeah, okay. I, something I, I there being, being visualized kind of thing it, it very much deconstructs perception though and I, I i like those arguments those philosophical arguments but i think i i think it's good to have sort of like uh, feet on the ground kind of view of reality and I, I like all those deconstructions of perception but I don't know I, I, I'm not sure they're, they're, they're nice and they're abstract but I kind of think well where does it where is it really taking us it's, it's kind of like um, making you question your own perception perhaps too much and then if you're interacting with other people and, and deconstructing their sort of perception I, I don't know it's fascinating but I tell you what let's let's let me break down what I see as the DMT experience Go in terms of outlining the principles, because I, I found from my research that, you know, the, the initial effect of DMT, and this is not considering hidden realities outside myself, not considering entities, is it, it very powerfully amplifies some immaterial aspect of ourselves some uh, mind stuff psycho spiritual substance so whatever you want to label it i don't care but it seems to project out powerfully and rapidly bubble like 
you know, and if you're indoors, it's going to very rapidly fill the room. It's going to make the room either look crystal clear or with a sufficient dose. It's going to make that room. It's going to make it look like you're you're in a very turbulent underwater atmosphere. And that's the, the seething energy of this mind stuff. I, I have assumed that some becomes trapped within the room and, and, and some must transmit through the room because of its its otherworldly nature whereas outdoors you can actually much better appreciate that sort of huge outpouring i mean it's just incredible how much of this hidden immaterial stuff is housed somewhere within our being and i i i did this one time and it i'm looking up and it, it's kind of filled the local sky with this sort of dense otherworldly uncommon substance and a pigeon flies through. And this this has happened many times before, you know, it leaves the sort of multiple tracer trails, whether it's a pigeon crow, whatever. But this one time, this pigeon must have flown low. And it, the effect on its visuals must have been so profound that I heard the pigeon crash beside me just a few feet away. And I, I could hear it. it hit the floor pretty hard and it's flapping its wings. And I was in such a sort of, I don't know, bizarre state. I didn't. It's not that I didn't dare. I didn't look at the pigeon, but I could hear it struggling to sort of bring itself, you know, back to a condition where it could fly away. And I thought that was really a really good example of something other than myself um, experiencing the effects of something really bizarre. And that being DMT significantly projecting bubble like some strange immaterial aspect of of my human being and 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 for me that that becomes then the starting point for going into talk of entities because people talk about set and setting and that initial effect of dmt has ultimately very profoundly changed your setting you've sent out a massive signal and whether it's going to attract an entity that very powerfully imposes upon you or uh I don't know, something high in the sky that traverses slowly, uh, slowly as a black orb UFO. I don't know. It's, um, I guess that's where I'm, I'm coming from. But again, I've said I, I, I know the benefits of remaining open minded and um, that I do. So I, I think that what, what you just described with it, with the kind of the projection of, of energy, yeah. that's, def, that's certainly something that I think comes much more into play in the uh, sort of the ayahuasca circles. Because I, I, I think I would say probably most people, or at least most people I'm aware of, tend to see like sort of smoking or vaporizing DMT as a very solo experience, or or at mm. least a very limited group. Whereas ayahuasca is these sort of much bigger so- social groups, and you do get that sense of yeah, energy projects into into the room, and then you all start feeding off each other's experience. And yeah, I, I mean I've certainly had you know. It, a lot of people start talking about things like sort of like telepathy and stuff like that. I won't say I necessarily had that experience myself, but I certainly have had the experience of a shared experience and what they call uh, energetic transfer in sort of I ask you, you know, and particularly when one person starts like like throwing up on it, then everyone just starts you start feeling each other's yeah um, sort of yeah energy and pain and stuff like. That. And one of the I, I mean there was one time I was I was in a, a circle and. There was this uh, this young lady there, and she just screamed like I've never heard anything before. And it was one of the most like harrowing like sounds just, just cut through, and like yeah, I'm sure like the whole room just just felt <laughs> that kind of that energy. It was uh, yeah, it's 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 you get a lot of very sort of like weird synchronicities going on in the, in those groups. But how how do you find the sort of the, the difference in, in have, have you got like a preference between the sort of the these more social ayahuasca thing and, and your own sort of research? Um, I would I, I personally think it's easier to go on a, an ayahuasca retreat than it is to commit to properly properly smoking DMT. I mean, you know, despite how many times I, I've smoked it, it, it doesn't make it any easier. You might be able to develop strategies that make it more easier to put yourself in that position and, and commit to it but i'll be it honest worse man don't yeah. it? i mean it's, it's... i was gonna say but at the moment those strategies just they ain't working for me well, i was gonna say when you talked about having the third book on the way i hope you still got an appetite for this i mean you've got you know, it's, well, uh, it's pretty impressive mate well we have to we have to see i mean i mean <laughs> um i'll certainly be incorporating 
ayahuasca into those. You know, I mean, my previous two books have always been with uh, the classic DMT machine glass bottle pie. Now I've sort of, you know, promoted myself to uh, a vape device. And I've got to be honest, those vape devices, they are ridiculously efficient and effective. You know, yeah. you are you are using so little DMT, but you're using it so well that like two, three, what seemed like really mild intakes compared to the glass bottle pipe. And wow, you are deep into it. It's uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, there's no guarantee I've still got the appetite, but I, I, I would say I've got the appetite for a third book. So uh, I probably have to force myself to make it happen. But the ayahuasca, I find, is um, I think you can, because of that sociability and, and the whole ceremony, I really buy into that. And and those Icaro songs, I mean, it's Beautiful. so, I mean, th these are these are hyperspace language that the, the traditional shamans and Amazonian users have brought back from that realm. And for me, they just tick all those hyperspace boxes. It's not it's not Portuguese. It's not English. It's it's hyperspace language. And it just makes so much sense. It's beautiful. I really buy into it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've sort of got quite a good relationship with uh, Shaman over uh, a Shipibo Sham. So that's like the sort of the tribe most commonly associated yeah. with Irish, or at least at least I'm most familiar with. Yes. And yeah, I was getting him to explain to talk me through some of this stuff because this again is when I was very much in like you described that it's very much true secrecy like tell me tell me all the give me the knowledge of stuff and yeah the way he described it was because I, I saw him one night in ceremony and he was just stood up and he was belting out these ikaros and just sort of just waving his arms like a madman and I could just see it this like the sort of Shipibo language you know when you see these kind of Shipibo textures it, yeah. it, that's actually a language that they can read it yeah so and believe so, uh, yeah so he was like this was he was just orchestrating this stuff and i said to him like 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 wheeler what what the fuck was was that and he's like they're just so blase it's like it's it's the way it is you know i just i i i, I just orchestrate it it's like that's how it is it's that's the agreement we have you know i i asked them to come in and they come in and yeah that's it it does what it does but it's uh you yeah know, it's you know what's really interesting is is this kind of like different styles of those Icaros and th there's one particular style that's really sort of upbeat and boisterous and jolly and it seems to induce purging. So we're in this retreat and, and everybody's in their zone going through whatever they're going through and then the music changes and I'm, I'm laid down, I'm in my zone and I start to hear people like puking and then I'm like, oh, mate, this music is like doing something to me, intestines, you know. Yeah, yeah. Ten minutes later, I'm purging into the bucket at the end of a mattress. And uh, it's just astonishing how, how these how these songs can have that effect on your body via your mind. It's incredible. Yeah, and they actually, I think it's just as, as well as, as that is that's how they do it deliberately. So they will... Yeah. So, so the, the sham will talk about, yeah, they will build you up to an intensity and get you to this point. And sometimes, depending on sort of what dosha, you do get this feeling like, I cannot take any more of this, this oh. even this sound like, and it's and yeah. it sort of, it, it pulls it out of you. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then, and then the sort of like the wave will break and you'll get a much gentler recoil and you just sat there thinking, this is just amazing. It's, yeah. It's, so it's, so it's, it's a very orchestrated uh, performance, I think, is, is a, a sort of, Perhaps that's the only word I can think for it, really, because they, yeah, it's 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 it, there's a, a very definite structure to it. And I, yeah. on some of the retreats I've been on, which have been on like sort of for, for weeks or longer, then even from day to day, they plan. Okay, so this is the day we're going to do this, and this is yeah. the day we're going to do, and it's a different set of ecros for each thing. So, yeah, that culture's, yeah. Just, just fascinating, yeah, I, I think. I, I really hope it grows because, I mean, in, in the UK at the moment, obviously, with what's going on with the, the pandemic and coronavirus, there's, um, there's a news item come out and, and it's saying that um, problem drinking at home, you know, people drinking alcohol, it, it's doubled since the mm -hmm. pandemic. And you think, oh, man, that's, that's terrible. That's going to result in all kinds of secondary issues with, you know, relationship problems and, and difficulties for children in, in in situations where they can't get out from a a parent who's you know struggling and, and turning to drink because of that and you, you just you know 
you don't know imagine th- those kind of things it's such a shame and, and you can sort of see this this i'm going to call it a medicine this this medicine and, and these retreats and these experiences so beneficial i mean you know in my opinion to, to mental health physical health spiritual health you know emotional health it ticks so many boxes yeah yeah for sure i mean i i, I couldn't agree more mate and i've really the fact that i couldn't go on in, on a retreat this year because I, I had plans to go away in uh, may i was going to go and do two weeks in in peru and then that obviously fell through because of the pandemic and okay i felt that so much like that so, so with this whole pandemic thing i think the world is kind of like crying out for contact with you know contact with each other with all sort of you know which they may not recognize it but is a kind of a spiritual need and in in that moment the opposite has happened we've been locked down the sort of options mm. are taken away from us mm. and i think i've certainly um yeah, I've, I've felt the sort of the pinch of that. And I totally agree with everything that he's saying about it being a, a medicine. For me, it definitely was. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I had some sort of, you know, some emotional struggles from, from a childhood. And, and this is the thing that has allowed me to sort of face those things. So I, I'm, I'm a strong advocate for that. Yeah, these are amazing substances, not just in, in the psychoactive effects and the awesomeness of it, which certainly is, is there. But in the potential for um, for yeah, what they can do, this is it's it's yeah, it's, it's almost that kind of like amazing that these things I've I've been sort of like undergoing for so long. It's, Isn't it? it's, yeah, it's it's a world changing substance and a world changing experience. It's just I don't know. It's it's, it's such a shame. I, it it feels like a little bit immature to say it's such a shame. It it's it highly illegal. Uh, I just don't know. How it, I suppose the, these people operating these retreats, they're they're they're, they're kind of, they're heroes. They know the risks that they're taking, but these are these are heroes. They genuinely believe in in what they're they're doing. The retreat I go to, the consummate professionals. It's just an excellent, you know, the the the, the staff are so attentive. Um, the ceremony from the opening to the closing ceremony it is just perfect. You know, it's. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's just a shame it's so few and far between, and um, yeah, I think a lot. Of... Yeah, I think you've got a rougher deal of it there in England actually than what we've got on on the mainland because certainly here it's it's not you have to be sort of careful with the terminology. It's it's not legal, but it's not criminalised in the same way that it is in the UK. Where I think it's UK they put it on the same classifications like heroin or cocaine or something. Yeah. Where, whereas here you can, or particularly in 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 Spain or like Portugal. You can openly advertise, you know, ayahuasca falls into a kind of a gray area there. And so do a lot of other things like uh, 5-MeO toad medicine and, and Cambo and things like that. So, yeah, I think I, I, I kind of feel for you, mate, that, that, that the UK is, is, yeah, a little bit draconian here in, um, in, in how they sort of clamp down on things. Um, but certainly in like, like Spain and um, even here in Switzerland and Portugal, you can more or less openly advertise sort of things like uh, ayahuasca treats, which is... Oh, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Yeah, I had no idea. I thought I thought it was like blanket sort of, um, sort of policy across Europe. That it was the same sort of high uh, category of illegality. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. Look at you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, so the, the ones I tend to go to are in, are in Spain. Um, yeah. Just because that's where the, the, the shaman, that, there's a shaman who comes over from Peru, this wheeler guy. Yeah. Him, so he does these retreats in Spain. And uh, yeah, and it's nice. You get like a sort of a nice mountain sort of Spanish, you know, setting. Yeah. You, know, you get this, this traditional sort of uh, Shapiba guy. So is that what you have in the, the situation in England? You've got a, sort of like, is it a Peruvian shaman who comes over or what, what's the setup? So, so no, the, the, these are uh, natives, uh, you know, indigenous people, UK people. And, um, you know, they're, they're clearly very experienced. Um, some of them have been uh, initiated into um, uh, Amazonian, well, well-known Amazonian tribes. Uh, you know, so they're they're singing the Icaro songs and they're singing them perfectly. And I know that because I, at the last retreat, I had the benefit of actually being in a retreat with a master a shaman. And uh, wow, I mean, that's just that's just another level. But no, I mean, you know, it, 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 these are in, you know UK people and they're doing a a great job. I mean, you know, they're, they're creating their own songs, uh, singing their own songs, uh, playing. 
recorded music, live music, just you know, fantastic. You got the the harpe, you got the 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 is it Sangara, the ray of light, the eye drops. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced those. I've not. I've not done. I've done rap. I've done plenty of. Uh, I've never done the, done the eye drops. Um, well, I'll be honest. I, I I've experienced the harpe before, and uh, it's a real sort of explosive assault on your <laughs> your nose. And you know, you you tell people, oh yeah, it's worth it. And then when you do it again for the first five minutes, you're kind of like not sure whether you've given good advice <laughs> because you're just in such a nasal uh, uh, and your eyes are a mess and but uh, obviously after five or ten minutes when the power of a medicine becomes prevalent you think wow that that is real i'm glad i did that it's really good yeah um, no, with, with, with rapid it was one that i definitely had to train myself to sort of to, to sort of get into it because when i went to do my first um retreat in peru i'd, I'd had rapid before then uh, sort of like with some friends who were going to and the, the sort of what they'd fed me was like, like that rap. This was just happening all the time on Peru, so it was, it, it, to get used to it. So I was like, right, it's a bit like kind of like when you're when you're a kid and you try smoke and you're like, you're, you're, you're trying, it's like, oh, this is horrible, but you know, yeah. you don't want to look like a knob, so you you, you sort of make yourself get get into smoking. So I, I kind of trained my nose out of that desensitization because when you first do it, yeah, it's like you say, you start like being hit with a cricket bat or something yeah. in, in the face. That's right. But now I've actually I've, I've, I've quite got a got a taste for it, and yeah. Sort of like uh, so, sort of tr- trying all the all the different kinds. But I just wanted, did you ever try the uh, the the five meo Todd DMT? Oh, still not. You know, I, I think I did an interview a few, few weeks ago, and I'm I'm showing off this little pipe I've got loaded with five meo DMT. It's still sat behind me on my desk, and as yet no. So I'm very fortunate. I, I've got friends who've. Um, enabled me to have access to the synthetic and the um the genuine toad medicine but as you and i'm not gonna i could sit here and say rob you know because of the lockdown you know that the, the kids have been at home the wife's been at home you know there's been no opportunity but that wouldn't be quite true because there's been opportunities where i could have sort of taken the pipe and sort of walked off into the fields and found a quiet spot and done it i'm just yeah, I'm terrified of it. You know, I'm not. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. But I, I know I'm going to have to experience it, and um, yeah, I'm very excited by it. But um, at the moment, far more terrified than excited <laughs> at the prospect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't. I, yeah, I don't begrudge that feeling, mate. It's. Uh, it's, it's. I mean, yeah. I, I, I did. I've done five of one time, and and that was the one time I did actually do DMT outdoors, like what you described earlier. And so I was in this kind of like forest uh, canopy at the top of this mountain. Um, and uh, yeah, I did it. And I just ended up, I just like kind of flopped back onto my back and I was stirring up through the trees and I'd seen all the, the, sort of the leaves interconnecting all above me. And just where you talk about the, sort of the black orbs appearing, I started seeing uh, chemical symbols appearing, much like the one on your T-shirt. Oh, and these yeah. were like, these started floating across them like 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 the trees were talking to each other in, in sort of chemical hor- yeah, sort of yeah. hormones which they, which is apparently what they do i didn't know this okay, at the time yeah. and then yeah and then i had this kind of inward vision of being the toad and i was like i felt like okay does this does this toad is this does it know what it's doing here does it does it can it feel its own sort of medicine here or is it like forever cut off from from experience i felt this like great sorrow for the toad that it would like Perhaps it's it's towards it's like you know a bit of snot like you know we we just don't yeah. think it's just another bodily fluid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How how bizarre that that substance is in a toad, isn't it? You know, I mean, I know it's within certain plants, but how bizarre that it's in that particular toad. It's really strange. Well, yeah, I've just done I've just done a video that, that sort of leaned into this because I was talking about uh, the book uh, Dune, and you know, which is sort of based around you know this this psychoactive substance. Which, as the book describes, comes from uh, worm shit. Basically, it's like giant, giant sandworm worm shit. Yeah. And uh, and I remember when I read this book as a kid, I was like, I can't, I cannot be reading this right. There's no, there's no way these people are eating worm shit and like getting high. And then as I've gone into my sort of adult life, and yeah, you find that some guy worked out to extract the, the this particular gla- like how do, how did you work this out? How did this happen that you picked up this toad and got this? squeeze this thing out and then start to smoke it rather than just wash your hands you know well you know i mean you, do you know what i think that's a really it's a really 
super profound and interesting question because the same question arises with, with ayahuasca. How with so many plants in the Amazon and so many, you know, cross permutations for, you know, uh, different recipes, how on earth did they work out that, you know, th this leaves and this bark are going to give this experience? And, and that that's... That's um, a question I'm really going to tackle in my third book, and I'm really excited. I've got some good ideas about that, and I, I, I've heard I've heard people with a much greater reputation than me, and I, I've seen them in conference, and and they've said, oh, you know, I must have worked it out by trial and error, and I just cannot buy that because the permutations are in the billions. It, that just doesn't make sense to me. You know, let's keep trying, and and then all right, okay, you know, after like uh, countless generations, if not aeons. We've hit on something here, boys. I, <laughs> exactly. I don't buy it. But also, just it's it's what it would take to to get to get to the actual the ayahuasca. So, assuming you found by fluke or whatever the right combination, yeah. Then to think, okay, right, we've got these two. Yeah. What we'll do is we'll boil it for yeah. thirty six hours into yeah. possibly the most pungent, bitter, foul tasting thing, and then yeah. yeah, once we've got that, let's just keep necking it until something happens, yeah. and it's. And then, you know, people are throwing the guts and stuff. It, everything about it, w it would be telling you, do not drink this. Yeah, do, that's do, right. So how they did it and then, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very hard not to put a lot of stock in that the plants told me to do it and sort of, you know, the, it was a kind of like a divine instruction from, from Mother Ayahuasca or whatever because it... Anything else just seems even less likely than that. It's uh... yeah, I, th I think I'm probably going to be building on that, but I'm I'm really going to throw. Um, I, I got a really sort of unique take on it, and and I have that because of my sort of long-standing interest in esoteric and occult literature, especially theosophy. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I feel I can really sort of put something. I'm not saying it's the truth, but I think I think a lot of people will find the idea that I propose really interesting. And again, when I say the idea I propose, I'm, I'm really leaning on sort of um, esoteric and occult interpretations of, of mankind's early histories. Yeah. Can I just, I can just jump on that word? Because I think, I think it's very interesting how you, you, you sort of use the word occult and that, that you put this as kind of like front and centre. Yeah. Because it is a very loaded word. Um, oh my God, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And I think for a lot of people, it you know, it conjures up in between, yeah. you know, Alistair Crowley and sort of, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, this, so, so when, when you're using the word occult, are you using it as a kind of is a substitute for mystical, or do you really sort of like see it as see sort of like something like DMT as part of that occult world, or how do you define it? So I'll start that by initially saying that I think ultimately the the most um, accurate and meaningful interpretation of the DMT experience will ultimately prove to be uh, an occult interpretation. So what I mean by occult, and I guess I'm using it in its light guise, L-I-T-E, light guise, is that it means hidden, concealed, shut off from view. I mean, you know, regrettably, it does come with a lot of baggage and darker connotations, but there's also uh, a very wide, broad ranging, deep philosophies behind that, um, the perennial philosophy that Aldous Huxley spoke. Mm. So it's not just about Crowley. And, you know, if people want to know what I think about Crowley, I really rate Crowley as a he was a first rate occultist, but I just don't feel I'm really drawn to his works. But I recognize that he was a one of those rarest of breeds, a, a natural born magician. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, I, I guess I'm using it in its light, guys. And I knew I would alienate some readers by including it in the in the title of, of my works. But I think it's a word that could really do with a, a rehabilitation. You know, it, it's a taboo adult word. And in this day and age, there's not many taboo adult words out there but that's that's one of them so i'm hoping to rehabilitate it and i think i'm doing a reasonably good job with that and i know people who have been put off because of the title and then they've read the books and like they've been very positive and complimentary i mean it means hidden so you know yeah, yeah, yeah. i think i i would definitely put myself as one of those mate because i certainly when i when i first saw the use the word sort of a cult then i was kind of like yeah I, it was it was Freemasonry. It was Alistair Crowley. I was I was thinking all this stuff. Yeah. And then I think yeah the way the way you use it in your book is certainly 
gives gives that word a good spring clean. And, and I think the other thing is, I think when, when you when you talk about rehabilitating it, it is seen. Again, this is only my own perception of it, but it's quite seems quite old. It's almost like a Victorian kind of word. It's not. It doesn't get used much. No, it's, it's, I don't think it's not had the same kind of new age uh, sort of spit and shine that things like mystical have, have had. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a if, you, if you're going to reclaim that, I would uh, I would fully yeah, condone that. Rob, I really uh, really enjoyed how you uh, you worded that. That was that was really excellent. Thank you, man. Um, I do just want, want, to, want to check with you, man. Have you got any sort of limitations on time or? I'm good, good, good for a little bit longer. Yeah, I'm I'm okay. Right, cool. Because what I did is when I told sort of people that I was I was going to be talking to, I put the sort of show notes on uh, places like Reddit and some of my other social media channels, and said if anyone's got any questions for me, yeah, uh, read them in. So I've got a few questions here. I've not had I've oh, yeah. just compiled them all today, so I've not had a chance to read through them. So let me just have a quick look. Okay. So the first one was, and again, you can sort of answer these as in depth or as quick fire as you as you want to. Um, how often was it? Would it be that you take the MT? I don't know whether they sort of mean in, during the duration of your writings or, or or currently. And then what would the what would be the expected result of taking it too often? Oh, okay, good question. So I'm I'm going to sort of answer that in terms of my three years where I went at it quite determinedly. And 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 you know it it's not like I fixed myself a three year period. I kind of went as far as I got. You know, I'd written the first book and I was still going on doing the research and documenting the research. And then it got to a point where I just thought, you know what, I just I, I, can't, I can't go on. I've, I've done enough. I think I have to have a break from this. Um, so in that three year period, I think if you break it down, I did somebody say it's like every other day or every second day. But there were times where I would smoke it two or three times a day. I mean, look, I'm not going to pretend that these are all breakthrough experiences. I was investigating the effects of DMT. I, I'd not set myself up to say I'm going to go further or deeper or higher than anybody else. I wanted to come to my own understanding of the esoteric mechanics uh, and what was happening. I feel I did that. So there'd be times where I'd had a really, you know, I'd have a terrifying or a really strong, profound experience. And I'd be like, like that's me done, uh, you know, for um, a few days, a week, a couple of weeks. But then there'd be other times where I'd, I'd take it to twice a day or, or sometimes three times a day in terms of the effects that's a brilliant question do you know what I, I think it comes down to the individual I don't think you can pontificate and say you know you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that it comes down to the individual and I, I was operating on a sort of really willful drive you know and as I say I was not on social media as case of go to work come home in my mind, I know I'm going to smoke DMT, but I would not think about it too much because if you think about it, you're going to think, oh, this happened once and this happened last time. And so it's just there. I'm going to smoke DMT, but I'm not thinking about it. Go home. And it's like you're loading the pipe on a kind of like autopilot mentality. You know, you're not thinking, you're just kind of going through the motions, go outside, lay down, look up at the sky, a few deep breaths, sit up three tokes, lay back, boom. And then, and only then, then you can think, ah, dear, dear, I've got something to write about. And I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's affected me adversely. I think quite the opposite, but I'm not going to lie, Rob. I, I had experiences which are documented in my second book and they're documented as candidly as I dare. You know, I, I, because of ignoring my instincts maybe when I should have listened I did end up scarring my mental health but I guess it's like a football player or a rugby player if, if you're playing the game and you're not getting some injuries or scars then how well are you playing the game so even though I've scarred my mental health I think it's ultimately been to my benefit in, in kind of making me realize how how precious and uh, pristine one's psyche is and in these experiences, there's no kind of like health and safety representative and there's no union you can go to. And there's no like, you know, you, it's not like you've got a manager and you can say, look, I, I need some help. I've just interacted with a really difficult entity. Can can you get somebody to have a word with it? <laughs> <Jay Lightman, laughs> you know, Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> you're very much on your own. So, uh, yeah, you know, but I, I, I don't I think it's down to the individual, you know, and I know individuals I'm in touch with I think they have the desire to smoke it or smoke it more often and 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 
they struggle because they're terrified of it. I'm with them. I've, we've already said about me and 5-MeO DMT, and the last time I vaped DMT was probably it's about three or four weeks ago, and I'm not sure when I'll do it again. I know I will. I just don't know when. Yeah, the, the, the feeling that it reminded me of is, do you, do you remember that, you know, when you were a kid and you knew that you'd, you'd done something wrong at school and your parents were going to kick your ass when you got home? That feeling in the pit of your stomach where it's like, and, you, and you're, you're walking home, it's like, oh, I'm going to get it. But you still, you've got to go home anyway. That's that, what reminded me of that when I was smoking DMT. And I always say, I'm jealous of people who do it for the first time because you don't know yet. You like, when before you first yeah. first tried it, it's that's, yeah. that's bliss. That's heaven because you've not yet tasted that, that kind yeah. of like a pure fear yet. Very well said. And yeah, I mean, you know, I suppose it's a bit like losing your virginity and sex, you know, the first time may not always be the best, unlikely to be the best, but it's going to be really special. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about sort of um, stuff that has affected with your medical health, but just in terms of, the, of your, your your attitudes and sort of aspects of everyday life, has, has that sort of changed for like the, the better or worse? And, yeah. and if so, has it... Has those changes been welcomed by like your family or? Oh yeah, like yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like my family have, have kind of like commented, "Oh, you know, we know you've been going through a lot of DMT experiences, and we've observed this change in you." But I, I, I've observed the changes in myself, so um, far more conscious of of my relationship with my family, uh, my wife and my two two lovely boys, um, but also with colleagues at work and even with strangers, you know mindful of the sort of um how you interact with people you know and and, and having time for them and and I, I think i think what i've really found and, and this is through my work is there's very few people actually listen you know listening is a real skill and and i think i was always kind of like I, i'd got an auntie who'd influenced me positively with that and i think dmt certainly augmented that in the uh, the strength of listening is, is is better than kind of like clamoring to talk, you know, wanting to talk when somebody's talking and you kind of like formulating a response in your head without listening. So, yeah, I would say that. And patience. And again, that's something my wife really helped me with when 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 I got married. I was always kind of impetuous and impatient. And my wife helped me with that. And I think my experience with DMT have kind of amplified that um that skill that that kind of attitude and and i think that's been really helpful i used to sometimes go out to work on uh if i was working a late shift and i'd be really irritable with my wife and my children and i think from smoking dmt i realized it ain't their fault that i have to go to work and since i've had that recognition not once have i been irritable since you know going to work it's like i just accept look you know it, it, it's what i'm engaged with it's what i'm doing why would I want to take it out on those that I love? Yeah, exactly. I think grat gratitude has definitely yeah. always been like front and center of my yeah. experiences. And, and another thing is, is really conscious of the influences upon my psyche. You know, what I choose to introduce to my psyche, whether it's a, a program on TV, a film, a, a book I, I read, or who I listen to, or what I engage with on social media. But I'm not going to lie. I'm still work in progress. There are things that I look at online that, that perhaps I shouldn't, you know, and, and we spoke earlier about transformation. I recognize I'm still, you know, working on, on my sort of the dark side of my psyche. We've all got it. And I don't think DMT takes that away, but it maybe gives you tools and strategies to kind of accept that and maybe shed a little friendly light on it and try and incorporate it into your, your, your personality, your persona in a positive way. Yeah, it's, it's definitely you, you're balancing the light and the dark or, you know, the, yeah. sort of the shadow and stuff like that. Yeah. That, that's one of the things I, I do find a little bit suspectly repugnant about somebody who, you know, claims to have had some sort of amazing awakening or some sort of and like they've never become enlightened and they're just free of all that. And usually, I mean, you know, the, the, the sort of the classics when you see this is usually some kind of like horror story will come out of the closet of how they've treated somebody like shit. So, I yeah. Think, so I think that the it, it is an, on, an ongoing journey. I don't think there's, I've, you know, I've said a, a few times, I don't think there is necessarily an end or there's a bit where I'm just going to sit there and hover and be completely at peace and never, you know, never want to, you know, 
watch a horror movie or play Call of Duty or something like that. You know, yeah. the, the, those things are part of me, but it's about these, it's this kind of balancing things and, or being more aware, like when, like, like what you sort of just described, it's like, yeah, sometimes I'm just an absolute dick for no reason. Yeah, but I literally. think I'm, I, I think I'm better at, at, even if not being able to stop myself doing that, at least recognizing I'm doing that and yeah. not getting so puffed up on me on like, you know, purse, you know, that, that was a, you know, some scathing put down, a, you know, put a, you know, put on some strange just because I was being a dick on the internet, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so there's a question here, going, going went through your experiences. Um, have you ever had the God experience, or, or do you see the sort of like the God experience as different from this kind of this um, consciousness experience, like what you're talking about? So I think if I understand the question, I think this is the experience of of total non-duality. No, I haven't, you know, um, and I don't know what kind of individual I would be if I had. I mean, maybe I'd be one of the, I don't know. I, I don't want to disparage anybody who's been there. I, I think that must be such a, a shat. I mean, I've had some profound experiences, but I think I think that experience of, of you know, total absorption into non-duality, uh, I think after one of those, you probably wouldn't go back and smoke dmt again so no I, i've not had it and and it's not that i'm not pursuing it i've um you never know what you're going to get when you smoke dmt so uh yeah. yeah not at the moment no i haven't but um yeah i mean i i think that probably has to be one of that has to be the ultimate i imagine isn't it total absorption of 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 self into non yeah. I, 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 I would say I, I have had that experience and yeah. it was yeah I, I didn't have to pursue it I, I was I certainly wasn't looking for it and it, yeah. It, so yeah it kind of happened by accident <laughs> um, <laughs> but um yeah I mean it, it, it's a funny one because I I cannot unexperience it yeah and I don't I don't necessarily believe it or like I say take it literally I was trying to look for this meaning in it but yeah, I, you know, I have been in what I can only describe as the presence of God, and I'm completely not really, I would describe myself as a, you know, as a diehard atheist mm. for the most part, and at least in terms of um, discounting the, the sort of the major religions, like I think there's, you know, there's a, a lot of man-made stuff there, but yeah, I had this kind of religious experience, I was like, what the, f what do I do with this? <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a, a strange one when, you're not expecting it because you, you yeah. think if, if you were like a sort of religious, you would be preloaded for it. But I yeah. wasn't. So I thought. Um, after you've sort of finished your, your writings, did you have any problems sort of adjusting back to what I guess is like everyday life or has it just become a sort of an ongoing piece of work now? No, it's, um, I think, I think the writing is really therapeutic and it really helps you reflect and integrate. It really helped me. I mean, it's not something I can go to work and speak about, uh, you know, but I think those three years where I wasn't on social media, I mean, I would occasionally speak to my wife, but, um, she didn't initially sort of buy into my interpretation as to what was happening, despite the fact that, you know, my wife's Muslim and she believes in angels and, and jinn um you know i think she's more on board now with it because obviously we watched she's listened to me and we've watched things on youtube you know and she can see that there's a, a a sort of big underground movement going on that that's got a lot of potential to sort of change culture society certainly individuals mm -hmm. but no i um i, I mean no i think i think i think I, I do feel like i'm kind of balancing you know, sort of Dick Can DMT research with my sort of life as a a family man with a you know a reasonably good job, you know, and and responsibilities. And I, I put all those responsibilities first, you know. Um, I mean, I've I've kind of fallen off from Instagram and Facebook simply because I can't commit to all three platforms. Twitter yeah, being the third. Perfect. Uh, without kind of like pushing my children away or pushing my wife away and I'm just not prepared to do that because then it becomes like well what a value really DMT on, on, the, on the individual on the self if it's kind of making me selfish and just pursuing followers and likes you know I mean I'd love to have more time to go on those platforms but really 
I love my family too much to disregard them. I think that's that's absolutely the way it should be, mate. And yeah. I, I I've certainly struggled with that balance, particularly when you're sort of you're up and coming in in these worlds, and and you you start off with like a very sort of tight community, and you feel like you sort of know these people. Yeah. And and then as it escalates, and you end up inevitably attracting people who disagree with you or who yeah. just want to give you shit yeah. online, then. It, it does ingress into your sort of your psyche and you, and you do have to yeah. make these choices. Like, am I doing this for the right reasons here? And yeah. uh, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm trying to find that balance myself at the moment between these different channels. Cause there's always something new to sort of like, Oh, you know, try this, try, try yeah. Instagram, try Discord, try yeah. this, try that. I mean, and, ca- ca- catch 22 as well. Cause you self pub, because I'm self published, I'm doing the marketing as well. So I, I've got to give, you know, kudos to these platforms that, that I couldn't, I, I wouldn't be here if they weren't there. Well, literally, because I wouldn't be able to market my book. But equally, I think that the value of social media is I've made some really valuable and, and enduring friendships, which I really cherish with, with people all around the world. And I think that's tantamount to the power of social media. If you use it, you know, for that reason to sort of, you know, not just market, but, 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 socialize if you hit it off with somebody um you know there's potentially a great friendship there that's that's what i found yeah just on just a, a sort of a, a side point because um do you think that with what sort of say you and i are doing in our own sort of like separate lanes and you know the, and the many many others are doing it i, I sometimes wonder like if, if there's what's the best approach here like is it should we is there should we stay in our own kind of lanes doing our own things or is, is there some sort of greater project that you know for forces to be combined and i don't get me wrong i've not got anything in mind here at all but yeah. you, know, you know sometimes I'm, I'm thinking like it, it, it's it's a kind of classic if we all pulled our finger out and we all combined and you'd make some sort of like psychedelic voltron which would just be able to sort of like yeah you know, get the word out there but then you end up with sort of it's slightly like being in a band where everyone's egos are clashing and yeah people so it, it's a very sort of tricky one and i i struggle like see thinking like does somebody need to lead the charge here but then i'm i know i realize i'm sort of far too opinionated and in my own world and it's it's yeah it's it's a i just wonder if you had any thoughts around that kind of thing yeah for sure so i mean i I see it as a a slowly growing community and i just can't see it stopping but i've I've come across some individuals who you know become really enamored by the experience as i did when i first started with it you know it's like you especially when you're young you know it's like when i was 18 and taking lsd you're like why isn't the world up <laughs> put it in the water put it in the- yeah well why isn't everybody up experience but i think really it, it's an unstoppable growth of a community but really if we start jumping up and down and saying oh you gotta try this you know this is the future it's gonna heal the world I think if you start to come across as a little bit madcap and, and pushing it, that's that's really going to be off-putting. And, and my approach is, look, I want to be seen as, um, you know, a responsible adult and a, a good husband and a good parent uh, because I think sort of portraying that puts those experiences and those substances in a really positive light. But I totally get other people who are a little bit more impatient and really want to push it. I'm not saying that they're wrong. I think everybody's contributing to this, this growth of this community in their own individual ways. And if I, if I was, you know, if I'd been 18, if I was 18 and experienced this, I'd probably be impatient and really sort of pushing it. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I think it's, I mean, look, my, my two boys know what I do because, you know, they've wheedled it out of me as that they've grown uh and and they're going to be proficient in knowing what the experience is obviously far too young to try it but you can see it's kind of it, it will spread and I, I think ultimately you're going to end up with a position where it, it it's reasonably widespread throughout culture and known about and potentially still on the statute books as highly illegal and i think at some point there just has to be a discussion a grown-up discussion about it and i think i think it will come i just don't know when yeah i think i think what you described there about it's i think if we're going to put that in a nutshell it's you are kind of you are evangelizing through your own actions so you you yourself are sort of becoming an an advertisement for this so rather than having to say to people try this it's amazing 
you yeah. can just sort of project the positive outcome, which is something I, I definitely try and do myself. And I've I've also got two young kids, so I'm in, in the, uh, probably a similar situation to you, where the last thing I want to do is force my you know lifestyle onto them or 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 anything. But on this on the on the same, you know, they, sometimes you know they go to the grandparents and me and me and the wife we go off to Peru and they say, you know, Daddy, where have you been? And uh, we, we, you know, I'm, we're very open. I say we went and did this, and what, why did you do that? Well, because because it helps, you know, because I, yeah, yeah. you know, because my childhood wasn't the best, and I needed a bit of help, so I, I, I reached yeah. out to a to a high source. So that's we try and be as, as as honest as we can without sort of putting them in a in a sort of a, a compromised position of, yeah, Daddy's absolutely wrecked off his tits today, so you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as as I was on Saturday night, but I'm I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of like by I I I accept what you're saying, like it's sort of e- evangelizing through sort of uh, attitude and approach. But again, as as we said at the outset, uh, I'm really sort of keen to promote the substance, the experience, and my interpretation. And 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 although I've alluded to being terrified, you know, of of, of commitment to the substance and five meo, I think I've got to say that. The experience, I've got to tell the truth, the experiences are phenomenal. I have had, you know, like when you're a kid and it's you're playing with your friends and it's just brilliant, you know, and it's like you're just so happy to be alive. I mean, the DMT experiences largely for me have been like that, but as a, for a grown up and seeing yeah. things that are just beyond your imagination and, and coming out of experience as having, um, you know, experienced profound ecstasy i mean f- f- far more than mdma i mean really archaic ecstasy and and laughter like i'd never knew existed and, and feeling you know being in an experience that you could literally if, if the chance was there to spend all day there you would spend all day there just cooing over what you see so i just wanted to put that out there because i'm conscious that we have said you know commitment is terrifying and while that's true the experiences are in my experience by and large phenomenally entertaining yeah i don't definitely don't need to explain it to, to me because i i understand that kind of that that balance between the the existential dread of trying to get your ego to go through this experience but the 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 absolutely sound knowledge that you want to do this and you want to do it because of of of, of how amazing the experience is and i think the i like the when well, you mentioned the sort of childhood there because the 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 thing that kind of jumps out to me, I mean, certainly there's a euphoria, on, but it's it's awe and wonder, and the kind yeah. of awe and wonder that you, yeah. you you've you, like I say you didn't you've not had since childhood. Yeah, and I think and that's the thing which I think is so medicinal, even you know about something like DMT, which isn't typically classed as like a, a medicine the same way ayahuasca is, but it is in that it can, you know, when our lives are like like what you described, going doing the night shift. Then sometimes you just need that sort of like that like, holy shit! It just feels so good to be reminded of how good life can be and how I just just the joy of being a human being and the joy of existing. That yeah. is medicine. That is yeah. in, its, yeah. in itself. And um, and yeah, and why that then conjures up these feelings of absolute existential dread is. Isn't it a paradox? It is. It's, it's insane. I because love that it, paradox. And as soon as you come around 10 minutes later, you'll be saying to yourself, like, what was my problem? That was, like, that was just amazing. Like, what was... But, uh, but yeah, the, the hour leading up to that, I find, is, is, uh, oh, is hellish. I've said before, it's like walking to your own funeral. <laughs> and, 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 and you know what? It's like, uh, how many times have I done this? I have, I've smoked DMT it's been phenomenal and I've come out of the experience and I'm, I'm, I'm saying to my wife, that stuff is amazing. And I'll say, I should be smoking that stuff all the time. I mean, I should be smoking it all the time. Nothing's stopping me. And yet it's been weeks since I've touched it. And I know next time I smoke it, I'll probably be saying, I should be smoking it all the time. But no, because it's like walking to your own funeral before you, you actually get there. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing you, you've got to... I think the, the true benefit of the experience comes from this, this kind of integration, comes from putting it together. So if you don't if you don't come back to reality, yeah. well then how are you, how are you going to use there's there's nowhere to use those lessons. You've got to sort of Yeah. There's no kind of like place where you can sort of reflect and really like feel the awe and the wonder just described. You you kind of need your monkey body to 
to feel like because at the moment that you're in it it's so transcendent and slippery and you think you're going to remember it forever and it just slips yeah. away from you but then you sort of I, I find I appreciate it more as I'm sat there on the edge of my couch or I'm thinking what yeah. that's just incredible yeah. absolutely agree Rob well said yeah absolutely so I've just got a, a couple more sort of quick questions yep. for you mate um, as, as you've been sort of going through this process do you find that you've been able to control the sort of the process more or is it always a sort of like a, a, a lucky dip for you so for me, it's always been a lucky dip, but I, I mentioned earlier about individuals who have got far more experience than me, and, and some of them are absolutely adamant that you you can control these experiences and determine the content of the experiences in terms of visions. I, I'm not ruling that out. I mean, it's been clear to me that sometimes the experiences have incorporated into the visions aspects of of um, of my life, my real life. But for me, it's, it's kind of been a lucky dip. And I have wondered whether, I, I have wondered whether, you know, it, it's one particular entity or a group of entities that are routinely interacting with me and, and, and kind of know that I've set out on um, research and authorship and, and have kind of given me a real mixed bag of experiences. I would say I've certainly found they've changed over time. And, and that leads me to suspect that there's a, a very, for me, a slow initiatory um, aspect to the experiences they certainly changed over time just to outline that you know became very visual uh, and then became invasive and then became ultimately more revelatory I don't mean in terms of anything like prophecy far from it but in terms of seeing these entities in otherwise consensus reality as huge sort of looking like a, 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 a ultimately transparent but very large multifaceted gemstone, very large relative to my physical size, and observing those, you know, in my, my expanded bubble of spiritual, psycho-spiritual outpouring and, and just seeing what I would say is a subjective evidence of... of other life forms i mean they for me were the, the best of my experiences by far seeing those and feeling it exuding tremendous power you know and, and realizing those are the the beings the entities that will impose upon the dmt user and fill fill them in a, a work put them in a world of of wonder and visions it's the same entity that will invest a portion of itself within you and act in a sort of quasi-physical manner whether it's massaging your brain or sealing up your lips and your nostrils or rooting around in your abdomen or doing all kinds of untold wonders have you ever do, do, you, do you go into the experiences with like a certain intention or anything or are, are you always kind of like completely open to just what occurs uh, i'd say completely open when, when i first started and you know you experience its power oh, i was i was praying to each and every god under the sun Wh whatever would give me the sort of metal to, to to put myself there and deliver me safely back and then i realized that you know I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that but i realized it's ultimately it's your my willpower that was making me commit so i just began to focus on that and the strategy was not to think about it too much if you st if i start to think about you know i've got this pipe and i'm, I'm gonna smoke it but this happened last time and that happened last week i'm probably never gonna smoke it and i'll be honest that that's happened a couple of times but it was by and large once i'd sat down and once i'd laid down to me that was my that signaled my commitment to the experience and then i realized just sit up and, and get on with it uh, so last one, mate, is uh, yeah. do you identify with any particular occult traditions like Thelma or Kabbalah or anything like that? Love that question. I mean, as a theosophist, well, no, let me revise that. As someone who really appreciates theosophy, um, I kind of buy into all those traditions. I, you know, I, I, I buy into what Crowell is doing, even though I don't practice it. And even though I'm not a big, big fan, I'm not drawn to his work, I recognise his... Uh, I recognise his standing in um, in the occult world, uh, Kabbalah, all of them. I mean, you know, sometimes you do these equal opportunities forms at work or wherever, and they're like, you have to choose a religion. And I wish there was a box that would say, like, all of them, because I, <laughs> I would take that. So I kind of like, you know, uh, 
for me, esotericism and occultism is it, kind of looking comparatively at science, philosophy, and religions, and and that's 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 what I like about it. Do you, do you do any sort of like pr practice yourself? Do you know what? That's a great question, and I've always thought that I don't. But do you know what? I've realised that I do, and it's just just a mantra that I um, have going over and over in my head. I'm, I'm not going to share it. It's personal, but yeah, and I suppose. I suppose that mantra and what it means to me and what my intention is when I put it out there mentally, I guess that is a magical practice. I mean, I'm, I'm reading books at the moment by uh, Franz Bad, and I've never heard of him before. And he, I think he's considered the the greatest adept of the 20th century. It certainly, I mean, it, you know, the late Franz Bad, and he was a, a Czechoslovakian um, adept. Uh, Hitler, Hitler tried to um, sign him up, you know, for his, his war effort uh, as a sort of, you know, practicing occultist. And the guy refused and uh, was put in prison, a, a pr prison camp until I think Russian soldiers freed him. And his books are, are phenomenal. I mean, very, very plainly written. Uh, and I, I think if you're going to pursue that that path of theurgy, it, it, it's, it's potentially very... It's a commitment, you, you know, don't take any half measures. It, it, I think like DMT, it's life changing. But whereas DMT is like very quick and instant, this is a, a process like meditation. You're committing to a, a lifestyle. But no, I'm, I'm not. I don't have any stars of David under any rugs or, you know, but, but I, 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 I do buy into those practices. I, I think there's a I think at the moment there's a huge disconnect between theurgy you know practicing people who, who practice magic without um substances and i think there's a big disconnect between ufologists because i think i think there are shared commonalities between all and these are themes that i'm going to try and delve into in in a future literary project yeah i, I totally agree man i think i think the attraction between something say like you, you, ufology or uh, you know ancient civilizations or magic yeah. is the the it is this kind of thinning of the veil in some way, whether it's a thinning of veil to the to something ancestral, um, or you know something you know like a higher power, something religious, or something you know extra dimensional. I think that craving, the the thing which gets its kind of hook into into all of us, at, probably at some point where it's like, oh, you know, even I mean, it, it even comes across in I think in our media, you know the. There's a reason why Jedi's are cool, and it is because the, it's because of the mystical element, you know, or why or when you see Neo in the Matrix, it's the, the mystical bit is what makes that so sort of, yeah, just so awesome and, and sort of identifiable. So I think the, that, that calling is in us all somewhere, and yeah, it's it just gets projected in, in sort of different uh, different shapes or forms. But I've I've sort of realised similar to yourself that I, I probably put more stock in ritual than what I thought I did. And even as, you know, something as simple as, you know, you know, what looking into a fire or, or watching a sunset or something like that, you, it means something. And it is a ritual. You sit there and you watch a sunset and, you know, and it just calls out some sort of commonality with, you know, through, through the years that at some point, you know, you're, most primitive tribal ancestors would have been sat there watching a the sunset just as you are now and there's these links across time so i've sort of started to recognize a lot of that kind of um stuff myself so yeah I, it's, some, it's sometimes sort of investigating a little bit i'm, I'm not exactly got a a huge map of, of, of what i believe or don't believe in that regards but it's uh, it's all interesting stuff yeah i think well well said i really really enjoy and appreciate how you describe that yeah it's absolutely valid cool. Well, I've got, I've got to say that I've absolutely loved this conversation. I appreciate it. I've, 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 it's, it's absolutely flown by. And we didn't even really particularly get into swapping stories. So we're going to have to do this again, mate, at some point and and, uh, and dive into it. Just before we sort of sign off, is there any sort of, um, is, is there anything you want to sort of say about where people can, can find you or, or um, yeah, or where, where you, you live online? Yeah, I'm, um, I, it's usually DMT researchers. I think a Twitter where I seem to be most ap active at the moment is, I think it's DMT underscore Twitter, uh, sorry, DMT underscore researcher. I think Instagram is just DMT researcher and Facebook is DMT.researcher. I pride myself on always 
responding to DMs, PMs, messages. If you're asking to buy DMT, it's just going to be a flat no. I always recommend a DIY extraction. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not here to provide you with, with, with that substance. I've always extracted my own. I'm taking that risk myself. I, it'd be great if you want to take a look at my books. I'd absolutely love that. This is DMT and My Occult Mind Light. That's a, a revised version of what was a, a much larger original that's since been retired. Um, because I thought it was too wordy. I really like this this version. And this is a follow up, and I've been pretty lazy marketing it. It came out, um, I think it was last year, and I, I for for one reason or another, I've not really marketed it as um, as well as I should. But it seems to be picking up, and people seem to like it. Um, so if if you do take a look be great i'd love to hear from you if you do and if you really want to if you really enjoy it and want to leave a positive review then much love and blessings that would be absolutely fantastic and i'd really appreciate that well i'll put some some links in the description below to your, your various uh, social media channels and i can definitely attest to uh yeah to that your books are very entertaining i'm, I'm roughly about halfway through your second one now and uh yeah i, I think i think the second one i i found I think it's because I had the original version, the, the, the wordier version of, yeah. of the first one. So yeah, I, th- I would I would say probably uh, jump in at the second one. I think I think your writing style is really sort of yeah. coming, coming to its own in, in that one. Yeah, I'd agree. Thanks for that. I really really appreciate that. Oh, worries, mate. well, like I say, mate, this has been a great conversation. Uh, if you're up for it, let's let's talk some more sometime. I'd love to hear I will more do of it again it. sometime. <laughs> it's awesome. Right, mate. Well, let's uh, let's sign off there. Thanks a lot for your time, and uh, yeah, well, let's catch up some point in the future. Cheers, Rob. Thank you. Good night. Cheers, dude. Ciao, mate.